Hey everybody, what's going on? What's happening? This your girl Tiffany coming through right here live in the fake. And on today's topic, we're dealing with Women's History Month. So I want to deal with the topic about Rebecca J. Cole, an African-American physician. And she was like the second African-American woman to become a physician here in America. All right. So I wanted to get into that topic. But I want to say this before I get started. I'm so glad that this is Women's Month. I'm glad because it gives us a chance to bring about exposure to women all over the world, especially women of color, particularly African-American women. Because we have dealt with so many stereotypes all right. And because of the stereotypes that has taken place, it has made people believe that this is what this is how women are or how African American women portray themselves, what they see on television. And it's supposed to be so called entertainment, but it's a misconception. That's how I look at it. It's a misconception. Um we have allowed people like Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Nicki Minaj to be the forefront for all women of color and to be the voice for African-American women. And that's not fair. And people think that African-American women have never accomplished anything or have done anything or have set any goals for themselves. And that's a lie. Because there are women out there that's doing the work, but they're not getting the credit or nor the proper respect they deserve. And so later on, I'm going to go into the concept about thought culture and how thought culture has become this vocal point in our community. So be on the lookout for that because I'm going to go in about this whole thought culture. Because that's the kind of culture we're living in. Let's just be straight up. But anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Who is Rebecca Cole? All right, if you guys can see the screen, cool. So... This right here is a drawing of Rebecca Cole. It's a drawing, so I don't have the actual picture of her. Anyways, so Rebecca J. Cole was born on March the 16th, 1846, and she died August 14th on, on, in 1922. She was an American organization founder and social reformer. In 1867, she became the second African-American woman to become a doctor in the United States after Rebecca Lee Crumpler's achievement three years earlier. So now let's look down here. It says early life and education. Dr. Cole was born in Philadelphia on March 16, 1846, the second of five children. And throughout her life would overcome racial and gender barriers to medical education by training in all female institutions run by women who had been part of the first generation of female physician graduating mid-century. Dr. Cole attended high school at the Institute for Color Youth, where she completed a rigorous curriculum that included Latin, Greek, and mathematics, and later graduated in 1863. She then went on to graduate from the Women's Medical College of, of Pennsylvania in 1867, which I have some information on about that. And under the supervision of Anne Preston, the first woman dean of the school, the Women's Medical College was founded by Quaker abolitionists and temperance reformers in 1850 under the name of the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania and was the world's first medical school for women. Her graduate medical thesis was titled The Eye and Its Appendages. Rebecca's roommates in her senior year were Adela Blinn and 
Martha E. Hutchins. Nearly 30 years later, Dr. Blinn wrote an article about how crossing the color line in Philadelphia nearly derailed Rebecca's studies at the college and her plans for a medical career. Now, this woman put up a fight, like many other women, to pave a way for many people, especially African-American women, to take on the opportunity to be involved in doing things that's more productive. But because we got this stock culture that has taken over, everybody want to be a thought. Everybody want to show off their thoughtiness. So, well, I shouldn't say everybody. A lot of people want to be influenced by this thought-ass shit. But you had women who fought and who paved the way for many other women to get an opportunity to be able to go to school, get some form of education, work a decent job, provide for their family. But that gets overshadowed. Let's continue. All right. Let's look at career. Oops. So after her schooling, Dr. Cole interned at Elizabeth Blackwell's New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children. In New York, Dr. Cole was assigned the task of going into tenements to teach prenatal care and hygiene to women. Cole was a pioneer in providing these impoverished women and children access to medical care. Cole went on to practice in South Carolina, then returned to Philadelphia and in 1873 opened a women's direct directory center with Charlotte Abbey that provided medical and legal services to destitute women and children. In January 1899, she was appointed superintendent of a home run by the Association for the Relief of Destitute Colored Women and Children in Washington, D.C. The annual report for that year stated that she possesses all the qualities essential to such a position, ability, energy, experience, tact. A subsequent report noted that Dr. Cole herself has more than fulfilled the expectation of her friends with a clear and comprehensive view of her whole field of action. She has carried out her plans with the good sense and vulgar, which are a part of her character, while her cheerful optimism, her determination to see the best in every situation and every individual have created around her an atmosphere of sunshine that adds to happiness and well-being of every member of the large family. So Dr. Cole practiced medicine for 50 years. Unfortunately, only few workers survived and few photos of her have survived. She died in 1922 and is buried at Eden Cemetery in Collinsdale, Pennsylvania. In 2015, Dr. Cole was chosen as an Innovators Walk of Fame honoree by the University City Center, I mean, excuse me, by the University City Science Center, Philadelphia. So there's your reference at the bottom. That's the external link. All right. Yep, these are the accomplishment, but so before I go any further, but this is funny. <laughs> I had somebody tell me that my talks be boring. I don't give a shit. <laughs> so it's funny that people have told me that my shit be boring. I don't give a shit. I'm going to stay boring. I'm not here for people's entertainment. I'm not here to make people laugh and people joke around. and You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not here to give somebody a good time. I, everything that I I do is not going to always be entertaining. It's not going to always be pleasant. So I don't care if you think that my channel is boring or 
uh, my video is boring. So if you don't watch, that's on you. You have that choice. I don't care because I'm going to still do me regardless. So fuck it. All right. Let's look at the next information regard to the Encyclopedia Philadelphia. Yeah, it's called the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. So yeah, each state have their own encyclopedia. Now, I couldn't get much out of this, but this is what I came across right here. The Women Medical College of Pennsylvania, which was written by Melissa M. Mandel. It says here, the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania founded in 1850, as the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania was the first medical school in the world for women authorized to award them the MD. It was established in Philadelphia by a group of progressive Quakers and, business, and a businessman who believed that women had a right to education and would make excellent physicians. Renamed the Women's Medical College in 1867. The school trained thousands of women physicians from all over the world, many of whom went on to practice medicine internationally. The college provided rare opportunities for women to teach, perform research, manage a medical school, and with the establishment of Women's Hospital in 1861. Learn and practice in a medical in a hospital setting. It was the longest lasting all women medical school in the nation until it became co educational in 1970, admitting four men into what became the Medical College of Pennsylvania. All right, so right here, it says it was founded during an era of reform just two years after the first Women's Right Convention at Seneca Falls, New York. Asserted women's right to an education and a profession among other rights. The college founders early supporters, faculty, and earliest student reflected this reform mindset. All right, so as you can see, it says founder William J. Mullen was a wealthy manufacturer turned philanthropist, a prominent advocate for prison reform. He worked as a prison agent at Maya Mensing Prison and established the House of Industry in South Philadelphia, a neighborhood center that provided temporary shelter, job training, and English language courses to immigrants and the homeless. Mullen served as the first president of the Board of Corporators of Women's Medical College. Others include Quaker activist physician Dr. Joseph S. Longshore, longtime temperance and abolition advocate, and Dr. Bartholomew. Bustle, a Ch Chester County abolitionist whose nephew, Dr. Edwin Bustles, was, or Fussell, excuse me, was one of the earliest faculty members. The inaugural class of 1852 included Chester County bred Quakers and Priest, Priestin, Preston and Sister in law Anna Longshore and Hannah Myers Longshore, and all of whom pursued it, rigorous education from childhood. Okay. So that's Ann Preston right here. The lady that I was reading about when uh, I was reading the autobiography, I mean, the biography of Rebecca J. Cole. So let's go ahead and skip down a little bit. Let's see what they're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right, so here's another information from the website, which is called Changes the Face of Medicine. NLM. NIH. Gov. All right, so you can find out more information right here on this website as well. Oh, well. Let's see. So going down here, it says a number of important early women physicians graduated from WMCP. I have to list the name of the women that graduated. So it says, let's let's skip where it says um, the WMCP always claimed a relative.
relatively diverse student body, inclusive regardless of race, ethnicity, or religion. It graduated some of the earliest African-American women doctors, including Rebecca Cole, Eliza Greer, Matilda Evans, the first Indian woman doctor, Anandi Ba Jashi, the first Native American woman doctor, Susan Lafeche Picote, and other women MDs originally from China, Syria, and South America. The college also admitted Jewish students in the 19th century earlier than many other medical schools, reflective of the growing Jewish immigrant community in South Philadelphia. In the mid-1940s, the school accepted five Japanese-American students, at least three of whom had been in prison and internment camps. Many of these women went on to serve their respective communities. All right, so... Here's the sources, the references down here at the bottom of the page. And you go on philadelphiaencyclopedia.org so you can find more information if you want to research right here on philadelphiaencyclopedia.org. It's called the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. All right. So let's go ahead and let's look at another source. All right, so right here, it's called Women in Science. The woman who challenged the idea that black communities were designated for disease or designed or destined for disease, excuse me. A physician and activist, Rebecca J. Cole, became a leading voice in medical social service. So it was written by Layla Manil on June the 5th, 2018. So let's see what this article say. In the late 19th century, the idea that disease and death proliferated in poor black communities was taken as a given even amongst doctors. Physician Rebecca J. Cole, one of the first black women doctors in America, pushed back against this racist assumption over a 30 year career in public health. As both a physician and advocate, she worked to give her own community the tools and education they needed to change their circumstances, inspiring generations of doctors who focus specifically on black community. We must teach these people the laws of health. We must preach this new gospel, Cole wrote in an 1896 issue of the periodical, The Woman's Era. That gospel, she continued, was that the respectability of a household ought to be measured by the condition of the seller. That guidance may seem simple enough today. A house with a clean seller instead of a rotting one is healthier for its inhabitants. But its real significance was to challenge the long-standing widespread belief that disease and death were hereditary in black people. All right, so So this, this was her thesis right here, as you can see. She wrote a thesis. It's called The Eye and It's Appendages from 1867. All right. You can barely read the handwriting, but that's just how uh, she wrote it back then. Okay. So that was the style of handwriting they used back then. So it's hard to read it. All right. So it says here. Cole was in an early vanguard three years earlier. Rebecca Lee received her medical degree in 1864 from the New England Female Medical College in Boston. Three years after, in 1870, Susan Smith McKinney received hers from the New York Medical College for Women. Historian Darlene Clark Hine writes in 
that Lee, Cole, and Stewart signaled the emergence of Black women in the medical profession. These three women usher in a generation of Black women, physicians, who work to make medicine accessible to Black people through community-based health care. All right, so it says, between the end of the Civil War, in 1865 and the turn of the 20th century, Han has been able to identify 115 black women physicians. The establishment of women's medical colleges and black colleges was what were essential to the training and success of black women physicians. But integration with all its benefits had a catch. By 1920, many of these colleges had shuttled and with the increase, increasing number of integrated co-educational colleges, the number of black women physicians dwindled to only 65. Okay, so... So this is the first building right here, which was called the first woman's medical college building. That's how the building looked. So let's see what else she has made an impact in. And was Matthew, I want to read this right. It says, after New York Cole practiced medicine in Columbia, South Carolina, though the details of her time there are scant. An 1885 article from the Cleveland Gazette said that she held a leading position as physician in one of the institutions of the state. Sometime before the end of Reconstruction, Cole returned to her Philadelphia home and quickly became a well-respected advocate for Black women and for the poor. Darlene Clark Hine writes that racial customs and negative attitudes towards women dictated that black women physician practice almost exclusively amongst blacks and primarily with black women for many of whom payment of medical fees was a great hardship. Cole did this to great effect. Ex excluded from hospitals and other medical institutions, black women paved their own way by establishing their own practices and organization within their communities. Combining the knowledge and skills she acquired in Blackwell's 10 minute house service and her lived experience within the Philadelphia's black community, Cole founded the Women's Directory, directory with fellow physician Charlotte Abbey. The, the directory provided both medical and legal services to destitute women, particularly new and expecting mothers, and worked with local authorities to help prevent and fairly prosecute child abandonment. All right, so at the turn of the 20th century, tuberculosis posed a particular problem for black communities. Even as rates of infection went down among white people, they shot up among black people. Not all physicians agreed on the cause of this disparity. There was a belief after the Civil War that the slave had never had had tuberculosis and it was only after the civil war that you see more cases of tuberculosis in black people we salute the everyday heroes who keep America okay I, I don't know where they're coming from the early risers the last believers the ones who punch in okay anyways so sorry about that I don't know where they know it's coming from the ones who spend their days building dreams and making it's not about the big okay all right so anyways it's about the gift whatever the way and whatever the world weather guard has got your back go to weatherguard.com oh this is where it's coming from hold on me All right. Anyways, sorry about that. That was 
I don't know how they had. I'm trying to. I'm trying to find something else in this article. Okay, so let's read on how things have impacted uh, blacks in the medical field and the welfare program and whatnot. So it says the in the journal article, culture, class, and service delivery, the politics of welfare reform and and urban bioethics agenda. So Gerard Ferguson shows that physicians refused to treat black communities based on a prevalent belief that disease was inherent. And so treating them would only waste public resources. You find some physician who said it was something inherent in the bodies of Africans, that their lungs might be smaller, that their bodies were frail, and that tuberculosis was going to solve the race problem, said Gamble. <laughs> hmm. Even black physicians observed that their tuberculosis was more prevalent at the slavery. But the difference, Gamble said, is that they pointed to social conditions. Civil rights leader and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois adopted a sociological approach looking at how social conditions contribute to disease. But he also argued that one reason for the high rates of tuberculosis among black people was their ignorance of proper hygiene. Cole, however, did not see the problem as stemming from ignorance in black people so much as the failure of white physicians to treat infected black people. Hostess of the poor are attended by young, inexperienced white physicians. She wrote in response to the boys in the periodical, The Women's Era. They inherited the tradition of their elders and let a black patient cough. They immediately have visions of tubercul tuberculosis. He writes tuberculosis and has or heaves a great sight of relief that one more sources of contagion is removed. So this is all the information I'm going to read on. You guys can read the rest about the Smithsonian magazine is a good source. It's a good website. So just go on smithsonianmag.com. All right. So basically, <laughs> So basically during that time period, they felt that tuberculosis was something that was inherited in the genes of black people. So they, that was their ways of saying that, look, there ain't nothing we can do about it. All right. So them folks over there, they just going to have to die. If they got it, they got to die. That's the attitude that a lot, many physicians and doctors had towards African-Americans, especially those that were poor in the community. Well, let's just say poor African-Americans for the most part. They felt that they don't got no insurance. These people are destituted. And they got tuberculosis. And they got other infectious disease. So they just going to have to die. So that's one less headache to worry about. Does that sound familiar to you? I can tell you that it does sound very familiar. Oh, and many of you not going to like what I'm about to say. But I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The abortion clinic. What do you think the main purpose of the abortion clinic was for? I hope you didn't think Miss Margaret Sanger, the founder, had good intentions. You know she believed in eugenics, right? It's a fact she believed in eugenics. So she figured that if she placed abortion clinics or the Planned Parenthood clinic in every inner city community, that it would control the population. So her initial goal was really to help depopulate the African-American community to keep the low numbers. And I hate to say it, but it has been accomplished. It has been accomplished. It has in ways Yep. So that was her way of saying, well, you know what? You know what? I should talk about her on Women History Month. Yeah, I'm going to do a video about Margaret Sanger. 
Yeah, I'm going to do a video about Margaret Sanger. And the reason why, because I want to come back and get into the concept about how she started this whole Planned Parenthood and the abortion cleaning. Because I don't think people really like know the history behind it. I mean, we think that it's a good thing and all that and it's very useful. I mean, if it's in case of emergency and there are some medical issues going on, yeah. But back then when abortion was illegal, right, she was still practicing it. She was saying, you know, we can still do this. We can still find a way to get rid of the African-American population. We can keep them sterilized. We can keep them from reproducing. And yeah, it was very, oh, it, it goes deep. It goes really deep. <laughs> it goes really deep. Oh, yes. Also, I want you guys to check this book out real fast. This book right here, if y'all don't check this out, I encourage you to do so. It's called the books, what's it called? Book of Black Heroes, Great Women in the Struggles. Yes. So it was written by Veronica Freeman Ellis, Tayomi Agus, Diane Patrick, Valerie Wilson, Wesley. So please check this book out. Uh, you will find out very great information about African-American women and or women in the diaspora and what have they done, have they contributed to society and all that great stuff. So look at it for yourself. Yep. But yeah, getting back to what I was saying, um, I'm going to do a video about Margaret Sanger. I really am. And I know it's going to strike some people nerve, but oh, well. Because see, we're going to get into the rule of all this. And then you know what's so surprising? I happened to read an article from CNN. And one of the Planned Parenthood clinics wants to remove her name off of there. That's funny. You want to remove the name of the founder. You want to remove the name of the founder. Hmm. That's quite interesting. But... Because they revealed that she had a darker side of her, which was the fact that she supported eugenics. And the whole concept of eugenics is what? To bring about population control. So if you ever wonder why you see your Planned Parenthood in your community, it's because of Margaret Sanger. Because it's, not, not, it's there for a reason. It's there on purpose. You will see it here in your neighborhoods. Then you will see it in the suburbs. It's there on purpose. It's there. But anyways, with that being said, you guys, I thank you all for watching and tuning in. And I will reconnect with you guys later on. And I want to talk about the things that's going on, the social issues that we have in. So... Be on the lookout for that. And until then, take it easy on yourself, all right? This is your girl, Tiffany, and I'm logging off. May peace and power be to all you people. Y'all have a good one, all right?